Hello all, in this video we are going to see about how to determine or calculate sample size for your research. If this is your population, you may not or rather need not do the research on the entire population. You can do it with a small sample, rather optimal sample or ideal sample and you can make conclusions to this population. The method or the technique by which you take this sample from the population is called as sampling and the number of samples you are going to perform is, is the sample size and in this presentation we are going to see how are we going to determine the sample size for your research. So the objectives of this session are to list the basic terminologies related to calculation of sample size and to calculate the sample size for basic study design that is estimation and comparison of mean and proportion. So let me start with the difference between internal validity and external validity. Validity is otherwise called as accuracy. Accuracy means it is the ability of the research to measure or estimate what it is supposed to measure. So how accurate the test is called as validity. Internal validity is the accuracy within the sample. External validity is when we are generalizing how representative is that sample is called as external validity. So primarily this internal validity depends on the tool which you are using. On the other hand, the external validity depends upon the sample size and the sampling technique. That is the number which you are doing in the research and how you are you taking those numbers from the general population. So external validity is determined by your sample size and sampling technique. Now why sample size calculation is needed? If we are doing a larger sample size, we need large amount of money and more time and manpower. It may not be feasible also and it is also unethical to do such large studies when you can get the results with a smaller number. On the other hand, if you go very smaller, then you will be unable to detect what you are supposed to detect. So what you need is neither very small nor very large, but an optimal or ideal sample size is required for research purpose. So how are we going to calculate the sample sizes? We are going to use formulas. The basic formulas can be easily remembered. Rest all formulas need not be remembered and we can use websites and softwares for this purpose. And it doesn't matter how are we going to calculate this sample size but what we need to know is we need to understand the parameters involved in this sample size calculation and enter those numbers correctly. So whatever way we adapt, understanding concept and terminologies is very important. So here are the determinants of the sample size. What makes sample size higher or lower? It is decided by these three parameters that is variability, precision and confidence level. Let's say suppose when we are cooking, we are dealing with rice. So if we take a sample of rice from this portion, it will actually represent the entire bowl. On the other hand, if we are dealing with a different cuisine, where you deal with different vegetables, then you need to sample each one of those vegetables in order to ensure that it is cooked properly. So the number which you are testing is higher in this case when compared to this case. This is due to the fact that the variability is less here and the variability is more here. Same way, as the variability increases, the sample size also increases. Next is the precision. Precision is the allowable error which we are going to allow in our study. So how accurate we are going to represent our results is called as precision. That is the allowable error we keep or decide before the study. That is precision. Then we need to know about the confidence interval. For that, we need to know about types of errors. So we have two types of errors, alpha error and beta error, which is going to be dealt in the coming slides. So here are some other basic concepts before moving on to the sample size calculation. We should be clear about what is standard deviation. Standard deviation is given by this formula, root of sigma or summation of x minus x bar or the mean whole square divided by n. So this is the formula. This is the standard deviation. The cap capital sigma is the summation and this is the mean. From there, we should know about standard error, which is given by the formula standard deviation by root of n. So that is standard error is equal to standard deviation divided by root of n. Then precision is mentioned earlier, that is the allowable error. It is usually denoted as D. Then confidence interval is this two standard error, that is mean plus or minus two standard error, or 1.96 Z alpha by two is 1.96 into standard error. So which represents the range of values within which we are 95% confident that the true value lies. That is, from our study, we infer that the true value, 95% of the times, the true value lies somewhere between two standard errors on either side of the mean. In other words, if we repeat the test 100 times, the 95% of the times, the true value will be falling between two standard errors on either side of the mean. So this is the formula for confidence interval. X bar is the sample mean, and this is the population standard deviation, and this is the Z value, which is 1.96. So we take it as 2. This is one example how we calculate this confidence interval. 
so we calculate and we represent this as the confidence interval then we move on to the type of errors in any research we try to prove or disprove null hypothesis and in reality there may be two possibilities that null hypothesis may be either true or false and your decision may either accept it or reject it if the null hypothesis is actually true and you reject it that is a correct decision if the null hypothesis is false and you reject it that is also a correct decision on the other hand there are two errors possible that is when you reject the null hypothesis when it is actually true it is called as type 1 error or alpha error when you falsely accept the null hypothesis when it is actually false then you call it as type 2 error or beta error so how to remember this error is we i usually keep this mnemonic art that is alpha error is rejecting null hypothesis when it is actually true the reverse of this is beta error that is beta error is accepting null hypothesis when it is false so when we reject the null hypothesis incorrectly when it is true is called as alpha error when we accept the null hypothesis incorrectly when it is false is called as beta error or type 2 error the magical word p value used in research is actually the probability of committing this type 1 error or alpha error so p value is probability of committing this alpha error or type 1 error or other words p value is probability of rejecting null hypothesis when it is actually true conventionally p value is kept at 0.05 level that is they allow error up to 1 in 20th of the times on the other hand beta error is accepting the null hypothesis when it is false the statistical power of test is actually the likelihood of avoiding the type 2 error that is inverse of this beta is called as statistical power of a study usually the power will be kept at a level of 80 percentage some may keep this up to 90 percentage what we also need to know is for this level of alpha error that is 0.05 we need to know about the standard normal deviate value that is the z value which is nothing but the area behind the curve at this level so this is 1.96 you need to remember because we conventionally keep this alpha error value at 5 percentage on the other hand beta error value will be conventionally kept at 0.2 the z beta value or the standard normal deviate will be 0.842 we need to remember this values to complete the sam sample size calculations without any hassle now in this presentation as i told we are going to deal with the basic study design calculations estimation that is we are going to do with the estimation of proportion and estimation of mean comparison of proportion and comparison of means and one slide we are will be having for diagnostic studies also so we are going to deal with the formula and problems before going to that i am going to compare steps of budget for building a house compared against the calculation of sample size in research when we are doing a budget for building a house we will decide what type of house what materials we are going to use how much the cost is going to vary between each type of material which we are going to use and the size different parameters then we will ask a friend who recently built a house then we adjust for the variations by comparing that house and our house and then we decide finally decide on the budget then if somebody ask you what will be the cost of the house then you will give an idea of budget for a next house just remember this scenario let me take you to the sample size calculation so here we first decide the variable and its type then we get a reference study close to our study setting and we take the prevalence or the mean from the previous study then we expect a variation in our study sample and based on that we decide the precision or the d value then from our sample we extrapolate the same for the whole population by calculating the standard error so that is what we are going to do in this sample size calculation now this is the formula for calculating the sample size when we are dealing with proportion that is estimation of the proportion or prevalence so the formula is sample size n is given by z square p q that is prevalence q divided by d square z is the standard normalized standardized normal deviate standard normal deviate that is otherwise called as z value p is the proportion or the prevalence of interest q is 100 minus p d is clinically expected variation or we call it as precision or allowable error this allowable error can be either absolute or relative what is meant by absolute is suppose let's take the prevalence is 20 percentage if we say absolute precision is 5 percentage then we just substitute this 5 percentage here on the other hand if we say relative precision is 10 percentage in relative to this prevalence so hence it is 10 percentage of 20 percentage so it will give 2 percentage so we need to substitute this 
two percentage in the place of precision. So that's how we calculate this absolute and relative precision. So how do we get this prevalence? The data on the research question being asked is very, very vital. And we need to do a thorough review of literature and we need to get this P. There after thorough review of literature, we have not got P. Then we can go for a pilot study and get this P. If you are not able to do pilot study, then you can take 50 percentage prevalence, which will yield maximum sample size. So here is one example for estimation of proportion. P is given as 28 percentage. 10 percent variability means is the precision. So what is the sample size they are asking? So Q is calculated based on this. So Z alpha is 1.96. Since they have mentioned it is 10 percentage of 28 percentage, you need to make it as 28 percentage that is it is relative precision. So n is equal to Z alpha PQ by D square. So when we substitute the values, we will get this results. So now how to write up this in your proposal or your manuscript? So you need to write like this, a sample size of 988 would be sufficient to observe 28 percentage prevalence of anemia according to this reference study with 10 percentage relative precision and 95 percent confidence interval. Next, we move on to the estimation of sample size when mean is the parameter of the study. The formula is slightly changed. Instead of P and Q, it is changed into standard deviation square and D remains same as the clinically expected variation or the precision. Rest all remains the same. Now we move on to the testing of hypothesis or comparison between two groups. The formulae and the problems will be dealt now. When we are doing a comparison of proportion, the formula is this. That is, we consider Z alpha and Z beta P, Q into 2, where Z alpha is the Z value at the alpha level, Z beta is Z value at the beta level, average percentage between two groups, and Q is 100 minus P. D is clinically meaningful difference between two groups. Suppose when we are dealing with comparison of proportion between more than two groups, then we need to take two groups which has the minimal difference. Based on that, we can do the sample size calculation. This is the formula for comparison of sample size when mean is the parameter of our study. PQ is replaced with standard deviation. So this is the common standard deviation between two groups. D is the clinical meaningful difference. Then this is the sample size calculation for diagnostic studies. In diagnostic studies, the main parameter of will be either sensitivity or specificity. Depending upon the needs, that is, when we are dealing with screening tests, we can take this sensitivity. When we are dealing with confirmatory tests, we can take this specificity. So the calculation remains almost same. Instead of prevalence, it will be replaced by sensitivity and specificity. And we have the same clinical expected variation. And in formula, instead of D square, we represent it by W square. So, but the formula remains the same. So we can get the sa sample size like this. For diagnostic studies, this is in case, suppose when we are comparing one known diagnostic test with other, most commonly used in microbiology, pathology, biochemistry, radiology, etc. Now, after calculating this sample size, we need to increase this sample size for these two reasons. The sample size need to be increased for this. Suppose when we are doing a follow-up study, then we need to consider this dropout. When we are expecting the response from the participants, then this non-response rate also need to be considered. So the actual sample size will be calculated sample size based on the formula divided by response rate. Suppose if it is an 80 percentage or 90 percentage, we need to divide it with the response rate, then there will be a slight increase in the sample size. Suppose if we are dealing with the cluster designs, we should increase or inflate the sample size based on the design effect. This is given by the formula 1 plus rate of homogeneity or rho. The maximum will be 1, minimum will be 0. This is decided based on the variability between the groups. So usually we take this as a maximum value as 2. So if we, uh, if we are dealing with cluster designs, then we need to multiply the sample size with the design effect, usually 2. Then we need to remember there are different formula for case control studies and survival analysis and validation studies also. Then the next question will be whether there is a possibility to reduce the sample size after calculating the sample size. Yes, there is one way. If we are doing a finite population correction, that is, if the population is small and very well known and defined, then the sample size can be reduced slightly. This is because a given sample size provides proportionately more information for a small in population than for a large population. Then how we will do this finite population correction is the actual sample size will be initial calculated sample size divided by 1 plus initial calculated sample size minus 1 by capital N. This is the total population. So we use this finite population correction when the population is very small and also very well defined and the characteristics of the population is very well known, then we use this 
finite population correction. So to sum up, what are all the steps in estimating the sample size calculation? We need to identify the major study variable, that is whether we are going to study hemoglobin or anemia or whatever it is. So we need to identify the major study variable, then we need to determine the type of estimate, that is whether we are going to deal with proportions or the means. Then we need to indicate the expected frequency of factor of interest. Then we need to decide on the precision of the estimate. Then we decide on the acceptable risk estimate which will fall outside its real population value. Then we need to adjust for population size, adjust for estimated design effect, adjust for expected response rate or follow up rate. Then we will arrive at the final sample size. We can do this using softwares, websites. The most commonly used site is this open AP. We are going to deal with five different exercises in five different ways. So before that, I want you to make clear that before going to do the study, we should be aware about whether we are doing estimation or we are doing comparison, whether we are dealing with proportion, whether we are dealing with means. Then we need to decide at the level of significance alpha. Usually it will be kept at 0 0.05. And the other hand, the beta level, it is usually 20 percentage or 10 percentage and the margin of error or the allowable error, the precision D. So here is this exercise. Uh, I may be going little faster. You can pause this and you can work it out. Basically, we are going to work out with different calculators. The estimation of hemoglobin. So mean hemoglobin is 10.2 per 100 ml. That is 10.2 percentage with the standard deviation. Consider the precision as 0.8. So we need to calculate the sample size. So this is the given values. This is the formula. And this is the answer. So you can calculate it manually or you can apply this tool and you can check out the answer. Next question, you can pause this and you can answer. This is the formula for calculation of proportion between two groups. You can use this formula also. In this formula, prevalence bar is given by P1 plus P2 divided by 2. So this is the formula. If you apply, then the answer will be 218. You can do this with clinical calculator also. Next is the mean blood loss. So this is mean between two groups. So alpha levels and power is given. So this is a formula. There is one more formula for this. You can try with this formula also. So if you try, the answer will be 113. You can pass and work out the answer. Then the next exercise, absolute precision is given and alpha level is also given. So the formula is simple, z square pq by d square. So the answer will be this. You can do this in sampleSize.net website. So this is one more exercise. You can re read out this. There are also uh, Android sample size calculators available. So you can go into Google's Play Store. You can search for sample size calculators. Sample size calculators available. You can use you can use those apps according to your needs and likes. So finally, to sum up, the take home message for sample size calculation is the sample size calculation is very, very easy to do. If you remember the basic formulas for basic study design, it is very, very simple. There are free software and online calculators available. But the clinch is before calculating the sample size, your objective should be clear and you should be clear about your variable which you are going to study and the type of variable. Then you should be clear about the basic parameters involved in sample size calculation. Interpret those values properly justification for substitution of those values are critical. So what are all those parameters this is the type of the study whether we are going to deal with one group estimation or two group comparison or percentage or proportion mean alpha level beta level and the precision that's about sample size calculation this is what basically expected from any research to know about sample size calculation and anything beyond this you can ask for help from statisticians and other field experts hopefully this video was useful to you thanks for watching this video